Welcome to the IPC's webinar on understanding exemption. We will be discussing exemptions in the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act and the Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act and how they are applied. We will look at our general approach, some interpretations, and highlight some key decisions. The basic principle of Ontario's access and privacy laws is that everyone has a right of access to government-held information. FIPA covers all ministries of the Ontario government and any organization designated as an institution under the law. MFIPA covers all municipal bodies, including municipalities, local boards, and commissions. This includes, for example, uh, police services and school boards. Any record can be requested. A record is defined broadly as any record of information, however recorded, whether in printed form, on film, by electronic means, or otherwise. The law tells us that exemptions from the right of access should be viewed as limited and specific. There is a right of access to all records in the custody or control of an institution unless the contents are covered by an exemption, the request is frivolous or vexatious, the record is specifically excluded, or another act overrides FIPA or MFIPA. Under the acts, government institutions can refuse to disclose records containing certain types of information. Exemptions fall into two separate categories, mandatory and discretionary. Mandatory exemptions require the head of an institution to withhold the record. Mandatory exemptions begin with the words, a head shall refuse to disclose. These include relations with other governments, which is mandatory under MFIPA only, uh, cabinet records under FIPA only, third-party information, and someone else's personal information where disclosure would be an unjustified invasion of their privacy. Discretionary exemptions allow the head to disclose a record despite the existence of the exemption. Discretionary exemptions are introduced by the words a head may refuse to disclose. These include a record of closed meetings under MFIPA only, advice or recommendations, law enforcement, the institution's economic interests, solicitor-client privilege, danger to safety or health, information soon to be published, and the requester's own personal information, even where mixed with another person's information. It's important to remember that just because a discretionary exemption applies, that does not necessarily mean that the record can't be disclosed. The institution must take the added step of deciding if the information should be disclosed despite the fact that it qualifies for exemption. In other words, an institution must properly exercise discretion. The exercise of discretion is a key component of the access process. In exercising discretion, it's important to consider all of the facts of a particular case and to weigh them fairly. As an example, take a requester who is asking for information in a police occurrence report in which she was involved. The report contains her information mixed with the information of other people, and the police believe it might be an invasion of the other people's privacy to give the requester that information. Because she is asking for her own information, the police have the discretion to either withhold or disclose the information of those other people. In exercising this discretion, the police should look at why she needs the information, the type of information, and all the circumstances to decide whether her right to the information outweighs any privacy rights of the other people. One question that comes up often in applying the acts is, well, what is personal information? Privacy rights under the acts only apply to personal information. An institution can only claim that disclosure of a record would be an invasion of privacy if the information in the record is personal. Personal information means recorded information about an identifiable individual. 
As I've already mentioned, recorded information can be in any format, such as paper records, electronic records, digital photographs, videos, or maps. Identifiable means that even if a person's name is not in the record, it might still be their personal information if they can be identified. For instance, if a requester asks for a witness statement and knows who the witness is, then even an unsigned statement will be that witness's personal information. The acts define personal information and list examples of personal information, such as address, sex, age, education, or medical history. These are just examples. There are many other kinds of information that may also qualify as personal information. We are often asked about the differences between personal information, property information, and business or professional information. As a general rule, information about an individual in a business, professional, or official capacity is not considered to be personal information, even if it identifies them. However, this information may still be treated as personal information if it reveals something of a personal nature about the individual. For example, a resume will include a mixture of personal and business information. In addition to a current job title and company name, it might include the individual's education history, personal activities, and other personal information. Another example might be the details of a harassment complaint against an employee of an institution, which likely will contain a mixture of personal and professional information. Even though the events happened in the workplace, the details in the record may reveal something personal about the employee. The context in which the information appears is important. As a general rule, information about a property is not considered to be personal information, even if the owner or tenant are able to be identified. However, this information may still be treated as personal information if it reveals something of a personal nature about an individual. For example, information relating to water well samples taken from properties or the addresses of properties which were tested for mold is not the personal information of identifiable individuals. Some types of records are excluded from the acts. If a record falls under an exclusion, the acts do not prevent disclosure, but there is no statutory right of access. The government may choose to disclose it outside of the acts. Examples of excluded records are those relating to ongoing prosecutions, labor relations or employment related matters, academic research, or hospital privileges. Under the Acts, every person has a right of access to a record or a part of a record in the custody or under the control of an institution, unless specific exemptions apply. So how do we know if a record is in the custody or control of an institution? It goes beyond the physical location of a record and involves factors such as the purpose of the record, who created it, and whether or not it relates to the institution's mandate or functions. A record doesn't need to be both in the custody and under the control of an institution. It can be one or the other. When a record isn't in the custody of the institution, if, for example, it's sent from a personal email account at a private residence, then the question is whether it's under the institution's control. In deciding this, you need to consider do the contents of the record relate to the institution's business? And could the institution reasonably expect to obtain a copy of the record on request? Here's an example. Patricia asks her municipality for all records pertaining to a special task force of councillors, trustees, and city staff exploring a proposed public education program. Information that might be in the city's custody or control could include minutes from meetings, proposals submitted to the task force, emails between task force members and city staff, or plans and recommendations produced by the group. These records were created for a city project, 
They are related to city business and are expected to be in the city's possession. Information which might not be in the city's custody or control include email records between councillors and their constituents regarding their concerns. Uh, these are related to the councillor's role as an individual representative, and the records are political rather than city records. Another example would be information gathered by an individual councillor for her own research on the issue, kept with her own papers, and never shared with the other members of the task force. In these cases, the institution likely does not have physical possession of the records, and it doesn't have the authority to regulate those records. Here are some significant decisions on custody and control. In a series of municipal orders, a number of requests were made to different school boards seeking access to student transportation procurement records from school board consortiums financed by the Ministry of Education. The boards denied access, in some cases stating that the consortiums were independent entities. Therefore, the consortium, not the board, has custody and control of the responsive records. The IPC found that the consortiums are actually part of the boards. But even if the consortiums are not part of the boards, then the boards still had control of the responsive records. The records relate to the board's business, and the boards could ask for the records and expect to receive them. In contrast, in a court decision which overturned one of our orders, the court said that emails by an employee of an institution which related to that employee's volunteer activities, unconnected to the business of the institution, were not in the custody or control of the institution, even though they were sent from a business account. Institutions subject to FIPA and MFIPA often acquire information about companies in the private sector. Some of this information may be a valuable asset to the company, and its disclosure would impair the company's ability to compete effectively. Under Ontario's access laws, third-party information shall not be disclosed if it reveals a trade secret or scientific, technical, commercial, financial, or labor relations information is supplied in confidence and where the disclosure could lead to certain types of harms. Here is an example of how this exemption might apply. Take a request to a ministry for any records related to the cancellation of a large infrastructure project. The response might include a variety of emails, briefing documents, bids from contractors, etc. Information which might be exempt from disclosure includes a company's secret process, design, or formula that is included in a bid for the project, a company's proprietary technical information such as architectural or circuitry designs, or a company's operational or development costs and cost analyses. This information could be considered trade secrets, technical or financial information within the meaning of the third party information exemption. If it was supplied by the company under an understanding that it would be kept confidential and the company would be significantly prejudiced in the marketplace if this information was disclosed, then the institution would be justified in withholding it. Here are some examples of how the third party exemption has been applied. In Order PO 3311, Ontario Power Generation denied a request for records related to engineering, procurement, and construction agreements with two companies for the refurbishment of nuclear reactors. Our office ordered large portions of the agreements to be disclosed, but upheld OPG's decision to withhold specific technical information and information where disclosure could prejudice the affected party's competitive position. In order MO3179, a requester sought access to information from the City of Toronto about a request for proposals for graffiti removal services. The records at issue form part of the third party's winning submission in response to the RFP. Parts of the records were found to be exempt, such as the identities of the third party's clients, detailed information about the work performed for other clients, 
and a portion of the company's training manual, but the city was ordered to disclose additional parts of the requested records. Note that the IPC will normally order disclosure of the financial details of contracts, including unit pricing. On to frivolous and vexatious requests. Sometimes an institution may refuse access because it believes that the request is frivolous or vexatious. What makes a request frivolous or vexatious? A request can be found to be frivolous or vexatious if it's part of a pattern of conduct that amounts to an abuse of the right of access, is part of a pattern of conduct that would interfere with the operations of the institution, is made in bad faith, or is made for a purpose other than to obtain access. Here are the types of considerations our office takes into account in deciding whether an institution was right to treat a request as frivolous or vexatious. There was an excessive number of requests by the same person. The requests are excessively broad or identical to previous requests. The purpose of the requests is aimed at creating a nuisance to harass the government or burden the system and the behavior of the requester. All circumstances must be considered when deciding whether a request is frivolous or vexatious. Decisions by this office confirming that a request is frivolous or vexatious are not common. Here is an example of how to determine whether requests are frivolous or vexatious. A requester has filed 10 requests in three months with an institution for records about a controversial project which has garnered significant public attention. Although this may be considered a large number of requests relating to one project, there may be good reasons for making these requests. The requester might be looking for specific details about the project. The institution must consider if the requests are repetitious or overly broad, and whether each request asks for unique information. Institutions must remember that the Act provides individuals with their right of access, and the institution must provide evidence that there are reasonable grounds to find that a request is frivolous or vexatious. If requests are repetitious or too broad, it is advisable to contact a requester to discuss their needs with them, to try to find a compromise before making a finding that the request is frivolous or vexatious. Here are some examples. In order PO3539, requests made to a ministry were found to be frivolous and vexatious because these requests and the actions of the requester established an abusive pattern of conduct. The requester had made 44 requests in under a year, and based on the number, nature, and content of the requests, his actions were found to be frivolous and vexatious. We limited the requester's right of access to one active appeal or request at a time. In order MO3278, a region received a request for records about the housing cooperative where the requester resides. The region responded by declining to process the request on the basis that it was frivolous and vexatious. We found that there was insufficient evidence to establish that the request was made in bad faith and ordered the region to issue a new decision. These orders and others are available for review at ipc.on.ca. This concludes the presentation. Our office is committed to protecting the public's right of access to information. We are available to answer your questions about Ontario's access to information laws. Thank you.